And today we're thinking the unthinkable, really thinking the unthinkable, because right now the Shanghai Gold Exchange is fixing physical spot silver somewhere between $79.10 and $79.35 and and per ounce, while the COMEX March futures contract settles at $72.82 leaving a gap of more than six and a half dollars, an enormous structural premium for metal you can actually touch and hold in Asia today. A spread that isn't shrinking, that isn't being arbitraged away in any meaningful way, and that seems perfectly content to sit there day after day, quietly insisting that the old rules no longer fully apply. Thinking the unthinkable means asking whether the long-standing agreement we've all lived with for decades, that the silver price is whatever COMEX in New York decides it is on any given day, a clean orderly figure that flashes across terminals worldwide so that everyone from jewelers in India to fabricators in Europe to investors in small towns across America simply accepts it as the truth, the central reference point that everything else is supposed to orbit around, might finally be starting to feel less like an unbreakable fact and more like a habit that is slowly, almost imperceptibly, losing its grip on reality. When a difference that large between the paper price in New York and the physical reality in Shanghai not only appears but refuses to disappear, are we still looking at nothing more than a temporary backwardation, one of those familiar market quirks we've seen many times before? Or are we, by thinking the unthinkable, perhaps witnessing the first calm sentences in a much longer story that the market has spent years trying very hard not to read aloud? Picture this scenario. You own real allocated silver bars sitting safely in a vault somewhere in London or New York. And the arbitrage window keeps getting wider. First it's a dollar, then two, then five, then six and a half. And yet, you still don't rush to ship those bars eastward because you know exactly what will happen the moment they leave your control. They'll vanish across the Pacific, swallowed up by solar panel production lines, electric vehicle battery factories, 5G infrastructure projects, and ever-growing strategic reserves, never again to be seen in Western warehouses, never again available to close the very gap that theoretically should be inviting them to move. When that pattern repeats itself over and over, when real metal consistently chooses to stay home rather than chase the paper price, thinking the unthinkable forces us to wonder how long a price that lives mostly on computer screens and balance sheets can continue to claim it's the one that truly matters especially when the biggest consumers on the planet seem increasingly indifferent to what that screen happens to be saying. This isn't the same as the loud emotional squeezes we saw back in 2020 or 2021, when retail enthusiasm and social media energy created temporary chaos that eventually burned itself out. What we're seeing now feels colder, more deliberate, far more structural, because China is consuming somewhere between 55 and 60% of the entire world's annual silver supply, because BRICS central banks are accumulating gold at a record pace and beginning to view silver through a similar strategic lens, because Western vault inventories have been in a slow, multi-year decline that no one seems eager to audit too closely, and because the old confidence that regulators or banks could always summon hundreds of millions of ounces out of thin air whenever needed, has quietly eroded to the point where very few people still believe it without crossing their fingers. Thinking the unthinkable leads us to imagine that we're now living with two different silvers, one that exists in the fast-moving world of futures contracts, hedge fund positions, ETFs, and bank ledgers, a digital high-volume version that still looks impressive on paper and continues to trade billions of ounces every single day, and another silver, the physical one, that gets weighed on old brass scales in back rooms in Shanghai, that changes hands in Singapore warehouses, that arrives by truck at factories in Guangdong, a version that doesn't particularly care what the COMEX ticker was showing at 8.15 in the morning New York time, because it only responds to the question of what someone is actually willing to pay in real currency for real bars that need to be delivered tomorrow. If that second silver, the one that has to exist in the physical world, slowly becomes the only price that truly sets the marginal cost for industry and for serious buyers, then thinking the unthinkable leaves us asking what we are left with when we keep staring at the lower number on the Western screen and calling it the silver price. Nobody needs to make an official declaration. There doesn't have to be a press conference or a dramatic headline. The handover can happen gradually, almost politely. 
The arbitrage opportunity stays open just wide enough to tease, but never wide enough to matter. Very little metal actually flows back west. The premium remains stubbornly high. And one morning, the entire market wakes up and realizes, almost as an afterthought, that the center of gravity has shifted across the Pacific, and there's no obvious reason it will ever shift back. This isn't about predicting that the old system collapses tomorrow, or that COMEX vanishes next week. Thinking the unthinkable is about something subtler, and in some ways more profound, that the unthinkable might not arrive with fireworks and margin calls and panic, but with a very slow, very calm transfer of pricing power, one that allows the paper market to keep humming along in its familiar way. While the real marginal buyer, the one who actually needs the metal to build things, quietly starts looking east and paying whatever number Shanghai is willing to accept. If the price in Shanghai continues to climb, if the physical metal keeps flowing in that direction, if the gap never really closes and instead becomes the new normal, how long will we go on, pretending that the lower, more comfortable number is still the one that defines the value of silver in the real world? Maybe the answer is already changing, not with a bang, not with chaos, but with the simple, relentless math of who consumes the stuff, who hoards it, and who ultimately decides what they're willing to pay when the bars are stacked on the table in front of them. The pages are turning, they're turning eastward, and the story feels like it's starting to write itself, whether we're ready to read it or not. If you're fortunate enough to have physical silver in your hands, maybe take an extra moment tonight to appreciate it. Those bars might already be starting to speak a language that the screens in New York no longer fully understand.